Financial freedom. It's what everyone wants. The ability to not worry about money, the ability to flex on people, and also sit on a beach for some reason with a laptop, which I'm sorry, is a dumb fantasy. Sand and keyboards do not mix. All you've done is give yourself a terrible experience with both. Sorry to go on that weird tangent, but also it needed to be said. The point is that everyone wants financial freedom, and many people look to cryptocurrency as a new way to get it because nobody trusts the monopoly man controlling the money printerino anymore. And because of that, a lot of new people have been happy to step in and promise to be the solution, the new monopoly man, if you will, but a better one sort of inter Celsius who we're talking about today, a company that takes crypto and also lends it that pitched itself as being a new place to put your money and borrow money. But that's kind of not a bank. It calls itself a new economy. An economy where, quote, financial freedom doesn't come with a price tag, which sounds about as believable as a diet pill that gets you a six pack without the exercise. But even so, Celsius's pitch was undeniably effective, promising up to 10% a year on your money. Since they opened their doors in 2017, they've taken in a grand whopping total of $25 billion worth in crypto. And for a while, things were going great, right up until on June 12th, 2022, they suddenly collapsed without warning and froze withdrawals and went radio silent. And it has everyone wondering, how could this happen? Well, that is what we are trying to answer today. I've done a shorter video on this, which we'll link here, but this time we're gonna go much deeper down the rabbit hole because I believe Celsius is unfortunately finished, insolvent, and I'm about to tell you why. It begins with one man and his vision. You know, I we need, we need someone to help us with our financial uh, accounts, with our financial life. And normally we trust people that we think are acting in our best interest. But what if these people are not acting in our best interest? What the banks really th think is that because we have to trust them, we cannot trust somebody else. So they, they don't believe that a company like Celsius can exist because who would be crazy enough to give their coins, their crypto, to somebody who's not a bank, right? That is Alex Bashinsky, the creator of Celsius. He's critical to understanding the collapse of Celsius. And the first thing you should know about him is that he claims to have done a lot in his career. We can get a glimpse of just how many businesses Alex has had in his lifetime from a 1999 article, which says this. He tried importing urea from Russia, selling Indonesian gold to Switzerland and brokering poisonous sodium cyanide excavated from China for use by gold mines in the US. Now, all of these businesses failed, obviously, but the point is he's always been selling something. And probably the biggest thing he's been selling is one of his claims that says that he's the person who invented VoIP, voice over the internet protocol, something that I know you've used before, even if you've never heard of it. Things like WhatsApp use it. But this claim, it turns out, is actually a little bit exaggerated. Alex Mashinsky says he's one of the inventors, but all the records I could find on the history of VoIP suggest he wasn't the first to do it or even a key inventor at all. He has a patent that goes back to 1994, but VoIP was already a thing by then with an app called Rascal in 1989. And he wasn't the first to monetize it either. A company called Vocal Tech was the first. But as you'll find, Alex doesn't let an inconvenient truth like that stop him. Instead, he pitches himself as a central piece of this technology, despite most histories of VoIP not even mentioning him. And this is a pattern of behavior of slightly stretching the truth. He claims, in fact, to be the inventor of a lot of things. He says he has patents that cover aspects of the smart grid, ad exchanges, Twitter, Skype, the App Store, Netflix's streaming concept, You'd think he basically invented the internet, actually. And in addition to him being this amazing inventor, another core part of his story seems to be that he's also a man of the people, not interested in money, but instead he's interested in fighting for the little guy and taking down mean old monopolies. This is his core pitch about VoIP, and also it's his new pitch today about banks. So I, I fought the monopolies my entire life. I mean, uh, I fought the phone companies, I fought uh, all the different uh, people who uh, f thought that it was a God-given uh, right for them to charge high rates forever to all of us. And, and so VoIP was a great example of that, right? Where 
basically we created a new technology, a new platform, completely decentralized, uh, uh, completely autonomous to the phone, to the entire phone lines infrastructure, and it wrote on the internet for free, right? So the same thing is happening now with money, right? And the first time, this is the first time that that you can basically replace the banks. The internet hasn't been able to do it. The first time that the technology, the crypto technology and the blockchain technology can replace the banks completely with peer-to-peer. -peer. So we're going from voice over IP to money over IP. Money over IP. He says that's his new project with Celsius. And I gotta say, MOIP has to be the worst marketing term for something of all time. It sounds like a chronic disease, honestly. Most people instead usually call it DeFi, decentralized finance, where you cut out the middleman and create smart contracts or little bits of code to replace what a bank might do, like lending, for example. Instead of going to a bank, you can go to Compound or Aave to get a decentralized loan. But crucially, in this DeFi world, Celsius doesn't exactly actually fit because it's not decentralized at all. It's just his company. And this is where things get a little weird. Because when Alex Mashinsky describes what Celsius is in theory, it sounds like he's eliminating banks. That is the killer. The, the application of basically eliminating the toll collector uh, uh, is the purpose of the blockchain. But then when he describes what Celsius actually does, it sounds like he is a bank. So Celsius Network enables you to deposit your coins it enables you to lend them to someone else and you get to keep 80% of the value. I mean, you just heard it. Celsius takes deposits and lends money. That's literally the definition of a bank, according to Investopedia, except, well, for the fact that in this definition, it also says licensed. And in that one sense, the worst sense of all, Alex is correct. Celsius is not a bank because it turns out they're not licensed to do this. If your bank loses money, for example, it's insured. If Celsius loses your money, well, you're out of luck. And this verbal sleight of hand is a pattern with Celsius. Mashinsky would use words like deposit and withdraw, which sounds like banking terms for a savings account, don't they? But in their terms of service, they explicitly spell out that these aren't banking terms at all. It's not what they mean. Instead, Celsius considers these deposits actually a loan to them that you're lending to them to then lend to somebody else. And when you withdraw your money, you're not withdrawing from an account you own, you're calling your loan due basically. And it turns out that's a pretty big difference. The other big trick they did was convincing people that like a savings account, they said their earn program, where you could get up to 10% a year on your deposit, they said it was low risk, incredibly low risk, as seen in this clip. Bitcoin pays right. dividend. Try Celsius. How does Bitcoin, Bitcoin pay 2%, a dividend? How does Bitcoin pay a dividend? Because we earn yield. How do you earn what? yield on Bitcoin? What do you do well, to generate uh, income look, on that Bitcoin? I'm happy to spend an hour with you. Yeah, you're uh, trading it. You've got to be taking a tremendous amount of risk. The Bitcoin no, itself it, doesn't generate any yield. It does, just like How? any other asset can generate yield. Gold. No, but we what, earnings, what earnings? What earnings does the Bitcoin gold, generate? Gold generates five and a half percent at Celsius yield. No, tokenized what gold. What are you doing to generate that? You, you've got. You must be taking tremendous risk to You're generate those returns. Risk. Well, that turned out to be a huge lie. They were taking tremendous risk. Now, I spoke with a Celsius insider who on the condition of being anonymous, told me that, quote, they were kind of degenerate in their DeFi pools. So it turns out they were taking tremendous risk, according to their own people. And I also spoke with a crypto sleuth called Dirty Bubble Media, who's been tracing these actions a long time before it fell apart to understand more. And I asked him, how is it possible that Celsius could earn 10% or more on their crypto? Here's what he told me. Essentially, they were engaging in some fairly risky practices, essentially taking borrow, uh, borrowed assets and lending on them multiple times in order to try to maximize the yield. And most of most of their yield was likely coming from stablecoin loans. At least their claims are that they were many, making these large loans of stablecoins out to uh, like institutional traders who were engaging in undescribed or undisclosed um, activities that somehow generated the returns sufficiently high enough to make these 10% uh, or higher payments. One way I had heard it described was that people thought they were investing in a bank with Celsius, but actually they were investing in more like a hedge fund. Do you sort of agree with that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that describing them as a hedge fund that was playing with retail money is probably a, a fairly charitable way to describe it, but they definitely weren't operating like a bank. So I know you looked at their DeFi wallets. What kind of returns did you see them getting there? Did you see them getting like 10%, 12%, 15%? No, not at all. Um, so what their, what part of their strategy was using DeFi to access stable coins. So for example, they would borrow Ether from their customers. They would then deposit that borrowed Ether into say a uh, compound uh, uh, DeFi protocol, and then use that as collateral to then borrow stable coins against. And then from there, the stable coins flow out all over the place. And that's something that trying to track that is very difficult. Um, but essentially, I mean, net, that actually costs them more money than it makes because first they're paying interest rates out to their customers to borrow the ether. And then they're also paying uh, between two to 3% to those protocols to borrow the stable coins and over collateralized matter. So it was actually costing them money on the part of the the part that's actually visible to us on the on the blockchain. So they're making all these bets, some of them risky, and I guess you found that some of these didn't exactly pan out. Can you explain that? Yeah, so there were a, a couple of mistakes that they've made that I found, um, and there are probably others as well. Um, one example of that was this thing called Stakehound um, Ether, which to get into it's a little bit complicated, but essentially they were using this service to take some of the customer Ethereum and deposit it to this ETH2 contract, which is something that has to do with Ethereum switching from proof of work to proof of stake. The long story short is that the money that goes into this contract is locked. So you can't access it for a very long period of time. It's indefinite, at least until the switch occurs. So what StakeCount allowed you to do was they gave you a derivative token that you could then kind of keep playing with and use to say borrow against or lend out um, and for a while, the market was treating that as equivalent to, to uh, Ether. Um, the problem was that StakeCount actually lost the keys to uh, over half of the Bitcoin or the Ethereum that, or Ether that they had uh, deposited. So essentially what happened is the crypto that they gave them is locked up for essentially forever unless the keys can be found. And the STE derivative token that they were using to kind of uh, stand in for the, for the Ether that they had deposited basically is worthless now. So that's it was a massive loss. I mean, we're talking tens of millions of dollars. Another example was this Badger Dell hack, which happened uh, several months ago. Um, essentially, it was like a phishing attack. They were participating in this Badger Dell protocol. They ended up losing $54 million of wrapped Bitcoin. Well, wow, that's a lot of money. But there's also a side of this, which is the incompetence of Celsius, which I think a lot of customers didn't know about at the time. Uh, explain that. Yeah, so uh, Badger Dow, in order to try to salvage the situation, um, came up with a, a plan essentially to reimburse people. And it's a little bit convoluted, but essentially the way it worked was that the, the Dow gave the, the victims these tokens called REM Badger, so reimbursement Badger. And they, the, only, the only requirement was that they had to hold those tokens in their wallet or in the Badger Dow protocol for a period of two years as the as these rewards were paid out over time. Unfortunately, and I haven't got an explanation as to why this happened, but a few months ago, Celsius actually removed all of those ben Rem Badger tokens from that deposit account. Um, and essentially that means they, they lost the right to get any more reimbursements from the DAO. Why did they remove the, the Badger tokens? I mean, your guess is as good as mine. So it's literally stupidity is what you're saying. It was the mistake. Well, so it's it, the, the, the mistake is so egregious because there was actually a warning screen that would pop up and say, you know, if you do this, you are forfeiting all of your reimbursements from here on out. Tens of millions of dollars just lost because of a stupid basic mistake. Yes. See, it's stories like this that appear to be something of a microcosm for Celsius, a small example that shows a much deeper problem. Problems like growing too quickly and having bad executives. See, Celsius, by the time of their collapse, was almost at 800 people. Mind you, this is only like a four to five year old company. And just in the past year, statistics show they grew their staff by 281%. You can just not onboard people this quickly. They were growing too fast and trying to scale too fast as well. And ultimately, it looks like they paid the price. Remember that this is supposed to be a budget bank passing on the savings to their customers, unlike, you know, the big traditional finance banks. But with this many employees, it's not clear how that's even possible. I mean, they were likely spending somewhere between 10 to maybe $50 million per year just on employees. 
And again, this might not be a problem if they were hiring star employees, but the opposite actually seems to be true when we dig into it. Here are a few examples of what I mean. Their chief financial officer, for example, got actually arrested while working for the company under money laundering charges. Their chief revenue officer also got in trouble when he started a business with a convicted money launderer while at the company. And then you also have their head of lending, a 24 year old whose face I will blur for privacy, who turns out to only really have been in the industry for four years before she worked as an adult actress, before coming onto Celsius, and then moved into a marketing assistant position before becoming the head of managing hundreds of millions of dollars of loans. To have someone with only a few years of experience handling hundreds of millions of dollars of customers' money is just always gonna be a bad thing. And once again, the insider that I spoke to at Celsius agreed that this was all sort of par for the course. They called it a quote, story of incompetence. That's literally how they described this whole company. But of course, you wouldn't know about that, would you? If you just listen to Alex Mashinsky, who describes his company in much different terms. He describes it as safe and of course, totally solvent. Only days before they froze all their funds, Alex was still going on AMAs saying stuff like this. Are our funds safe at Celsius? Can you address that for the audience? Yes, so not just that they're safe, again, we provided anyone who wanted to withdraw partially or fully, there were, were no problems. I know people are uh, concerned about the whole market and they were specifically concerned with the Terra Luna situation that we've publicly stated many times that we, would, we didn't lend to them, we, were, we didn't buy Luna or UST, we were not like many others who invested in the project, we didn't have any exposure to that. And not only was he saying everything's fine, he would frequently get angry at people accusing his money of not having all the dollars or just asking questions. For example, when this user said that he hopes retail investors can get out, Alex responded, Mike, do you even know one person who has a problem with drawing from Celsius? Why spread FUD and misinformation? If you are paid for this, then let everyone know you are picking sides. Otherwise, our job is to fight TradFi together. But it's not just people on Twitter they're going after. When this YouTuber criticized Celsius, he also got in trouble, but this time received a cease and desist letter from them. He joins me now, Upper Echelon Gamers. Why do you think Celsius was so worried about the criticism you were giving them and how vindicated do you feel that you've basically been right about them this whole time? Alex Mashinsky has a pretty long track record, in my opinion, of making false accusations or false statements. And right up until 24 hours before uh, they closed down all withdrawals, he was saying, do you know even a single person who can't get their money? Why are you spreading FUD? Fear, uncertainty, doubt, right? This buzzword to discredit criticism. So yeah, there, there is an element of, I guess, there's a personal side to it where I do feel a sense of, ha, gotcha, you know, why would you send me a letter like that? Why would you fixate, hyperfixate on one tiny portion of a video that, in my opinion, highlighted very extreme things that should be looked at by the community? Pieces of information that are not well known, things that he's denied in AMAs, such as, pretending he doesn't know who Moshi Hogeg is, and yet he was an advisor to Moshi Hogeg's Siren Labs, while also simultaneously Moshi Hogeg was an advisor on Celsius years prior. So things like that. So so getting a letter like that, that hyper fixates on one tiny thing to try and I think strong arm me and intimidate me into not speaking, it does feel good to be right. But like I said, double-edged sword, because being right means a bad thing for a great deal of people. Well said, and I will link his YouTube channel below. The point I'm trying to make is, that Celsius didn't just have problems in the immediate term like some people think they did. Rather, it seems that they had every imaginable problem from incompetent management to the fact that it seemed like a bloated company. It also is not clear that they were ever making enough yield to pay back their investors. And maybe worst of all, they would publicly put on a front that everything's fine while secretly uh, trying to hide the fact that they were what looks like seconds away from insolvency. Even a day before freezing withdrawals, their Twitter account was bragging about how quick and easy it is to swap coins with them. They say it takes less time than it took to write this tweet. And this, to me, is unforgivable. They know that they're about to go under and they're trying to bring new investors in, right? That is so 
disgusting. Not only that, it also looks like Alex Mashinsky was pretending to be sick. Only two days before uh, everything went under, he said that he lost his voice and was unable to attend an AMA and said he had to reschedule it. And honestly, all indications point to the fact they knew what was going on and chose to hide this fact from their customers who they knew were going to get screwed because remember that customers were not depositing, they were loaning to Celsius. This was an unsecured loan, meaning that when everything goes belly up, well, too bad. You're gonna be the last one to get paid as one of the you know regular retail investors. On the other hand, a lot of the loans that Celsius did have from other big companies like Tether, who they reportedly borrowed a billion dollars from, these were collateralized loans. So Tether boasted the other day that they had no exposure to Celsius's collapse and just liquidated them. It's also worth noting that Tether is a massive shareholder of Celsius. Go figure. So once again, the big guys get out fine and the little guy gets squashed. And so it's at this point that we have to say Celsius looks pretty much unsolvent, especially if they got liquidated for almost a billion dollars. They've lost money on Badger Dow, on Stakehound. They're losing money everywhere and everyone wants their money back at the same time. Now, I know things are getting heavy. As I said, Celsius looks insolvent from top to bottom and there's been talk of them trying to find some way to sort this all out. But I find it very ironic who they turn to in their time of need, this fake bank that sees the big banks as bad guys. You know who they turn to when they finally admit that they screwed up? They turn to Citigroup which is a bank. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Can we all just appreciate this fact that this fake bank, which was claiming to you know, be saving the people, is now turning to a real bank in their time of crisis. You just can't make this stuff up. And that maybe is the only funny part of this whole story because I do have to say there is some bad news, which is that Alex Mashinsky looks like he's walking away with, um, let me uh, check here, uh, millions of dollars. How is that possible? Well, because of Celsius token, the crypto token they built around their company, also known as Cell. When it started, it really didn't do much. There was no real customer demand, but through some clever manipulation and incentives, Alex managed to get himself some real demand for this token that pretty much has no reason to exist. To understand how that's possible, you have to start by knowing that Alex Mashinsky was just sort of given a lot of these tokens to start, obviously. He's the largest individual owner of Cell, but he can sell them whenever he wants to. And of course, the problem is, why would you buy this token that he automatically has a bunch of money in if it's not like gonna give you a share in the profit of the company? Well, they thought of a brilliant way to sort of create demand out of thin air. So you know how you can invest your crypto in Celsius and earn a yield, right? Well, it turns out that if you'd simply accept your payment in Cell tokens, instead of let's say, your native cryptocurrency you deposited, you'd be paid extra money, extra interest, which is pretty ingenious because it makes people start to get into your token. But it wasn't just that they did. They also added something called a loyalty program, where if you held a balance of their native token, you'd get extra rewards on your interest with the platinum level, giving you 30% more on your interest payments. And if you think the degeneracy stops there, well, of course you're wrong because they go even further. The next layer they added onto that is that you can actually stake your Celsius in their earning program as well and earn interest on your interest with bonus interest. Is everyone following that? That's the way Celsius inflated their coins value, which frankly sort of had no reason to exist except to give their founder a way out of the token himself and sell it he did. Alex Mashinsky, it turns out, was sort of constantly selling this sell token. And I spoke to Dirty Bubble Media about this once again, and here's what he said. Yeah, so Alex's selling was uh, kind of a focus of a lot of my work. There was a total lack of transparency around it. Um, I mean, Celsius often would kind of tout their their transparency on things, but when it came to these sales, he, he would admit that he was selling some tokens, but would never give a specific amount. So, so based just on the numbers that Celsius itself provided, they have a list called the top 500 holder list that they would periodically update. That was the top 500 holders of this sell token. Um, it looked like there were several million tokens that were sold by Mashinsky over a period of about a year. What is the rough US dollar um, um, kind of equivalent of that? Tens of millions, tens of millions. So he's walking away basically even more rich than he was before. And his users are walking away what seems like maybe bankrupt. Uh, very possibly, yes. Wow, that's heartbreaking. 
When I later went to the insider I'd been talking to at Celsius and asked them what they thought about this whole situation, they told me sort of a similar sentiment. They said two words, it's over. So even though I don't like to give bad news on this channel, despite what everyone thinks probably, I do have to agree. I think um, Celsius's time as a fake bank, LARPing as Robin Hood, is coming to an end. Ironically, they ended up screwing regular people way worse than the real banks ever will. And it's become a huge cautionary tale to not just listen to people because they're saying what you want to hear. They told people that financial freedom was just an investment away, that they would do all the heavy lifting and all you had to do was sit back and unbank yourself by banking yourself. And unfortunately, that's just kind of where the story ends. I know it's a bit of a bummer today, guys. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.